right, welcome to the cantata this evening. Thank you for coming out on a beautiful Saturday, and I appreciate your attendance here this evening. We're going to open with a word of prayer and uh, get right into the cantata called Lift Him Up. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening now. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together here tonight. And, Lord, we thank you for a risen Savior. And we thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to share that story once again here this evening. Bless the choir. Uh, help them, Lord, to do their very best. Uh, we know that many, many hours of practice have gone into this, and I pray that uh, the message of the resurrection of Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection will come through this evening. Bless these who are, have speaking parts that they'll do well as well. And Lord, each one who's here this evening, uh, help us to listen carefully. And we ask that you'd minister to our hearts tonight. And give each of each of us what we need from you during this next hour or so that we spend together. And we'll thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father.
Jerusalem, the holy city, is a special place to a lot of people. In Psalm 122, the Bible tells us, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It seems strange the holy city would be a place of strife and unrest, but it's true. Even if you went to Jerusalem today, you would visit the site of the ancient Jewish temple, and you'd see lots of religious people trying to worship, but you'd also see a lot of heavily armed soldiers trying to keep the peace. This is the same Jerusalem that Jesus entered almost 2,000 years ago. He came into a city during a very busy Jewish holiday. Worshippers were everywhere, and soldiers were trying to keep the peace. The Jews were tired of taking orders from the Roman soldiers and paying taxes to Caesar. They wanted a leader of their own choosing, a Messiah, who would usher in the golden age of Jewish power and prosperity. The news of Jesus' great miracles had spread throughout Israel. Everyone was talking about him. So when Jesus entered in Jerusalem during the Passover week, the people were ready. Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Glory to God! Hosanna in the highest! Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna. When I saw how the crowd responded to Jesus, I was so happy for my son. The angel had told me that this day would come, but I still could hardly believe it. I was so excited for him. Jesus deserved every bit of the honor he was getting. If they knew him as I knew him, they would have crowned him long ago. My dear precious boy had been a servant to us all, and now he would be a king. I warned Pilate that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. As high priest, I demanded action. But Pilate just chuckled and replied, Noble Caiaphas, I do not possess your great skill for solving such complex religious squabbles. Well, there's going to be trouble. I can feel it. Some of the rabble even calls this Jesus the Messiah. Can you believe it? First, he's a carpenter. Now he's a messiah? Ha! These poor deluded fools. The crowd lifts this Jesus up, but I will lay him low. Simon Peter, follow me. Those were the first words Jesus said to me. Oh, I've seen so much since then. The healings, the miracles. He is the Christ, and now others are beginning to see it too. We're all shouting, Hosanna! Together. This is what I've been waiting for. They're going to crown Jesus the king, and I, Peter, will reign with him. Hosanna! Hosanna to the king! Yeah. 
It was cold that night. A wisp of a cloud half shaded the moon. Still, quiet. I had never seen him like that before. He prayed feverishly on his knees and on his face, and he spoke again. Not my will, but thine be done. For a moment, I thought I seen another person with him, comforting him, a tall, shining figure in terrifying white. But my Lord was standing over me as I huddled under the tree. Simon, are you sleeping? Could mm. you not watch one hour with me? My eyes were so heavy. I had vowed to go to the grave with him. But a simple task of staying awake I found so difficult. And he spoke again. The hour is come. Then Jesus looked beyond me into the darkness. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. He that betrays me is at hand. And then I heard them. The clamor of an angry mob shattered the silence in the garden. And at the head of the intruders was Judas. Judas, one of our own. The traitor approached us, and trembling slightly, I heard him whisper, Hail, Master, and then betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away. And what did we do, his faithful disciples? We forsook him and ran off into the night, cowards, every one of us. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Now will silence this blasphemer. I cannot allow this self-appointed Messiah to defy our religious system and get away with it. <laughs> Thirty pieces of silver was a cheap price to pay for peace in Jerusalem. But Peter followed him afar off under the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. They struck him and they spit on him. And I huddled by the fire trying to stay warm that cold night. I didn't know what to do. I had seen him perform great wonders. Why wouldn't he save himself? You were with Jesus of Galilee. No, I don't know him. Are you not one of his disciples? I don't know what you're talking about. Surely you are one of them. You're speaking. I know not the man. And then the cock crew, and my Lord was staring right at me. No, it was just as he had said. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly.
I did my best to stir the people up of the city against Jesus, and it worked. By the time we reached Pilate, the Roman governor, the people were in a frenzy. Pilate tried to pacify the mob, but they would have none of it. They were thirsty for blood, Jesus' blood. And Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! him! When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people, and said his blood be on us and on our children then Pilate had Jesus beaten so severely that even I could hardly recognize him but that wasn't enough after what seemed like an eternity of torture and suffering Pilate delivered Jesus my son to be crucified
They crucified Jesus. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They lifted him up on the cross, and where was I? Hiding in a dark room, crouching in some shadowy corner like a frightened mouse. I jumped at every sound, thinking the soldiers were coming after me next. I should have been at his cross. I just couldn't. I couldn't force myself to go. This Jesus bragged that he could destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. He said he was the son of God. Well... We have lifted up this pretender so that all may see how powerful he truly is. The same people who shouted Hosanna to the king are now enjoying the spectacle of his execution. Look at this blasphemer now, nailed to a worthless stick of wood, gagging and gasping like any other common criminal. In a few months' time, no one will even remember his name. And there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. I actually thought it would kill me to see Jesus on that cross. But I had to be there. He was my child. I had always been there when he needed me since the day he was born. When he was sick as a little boy, I would hold him close, rub his forehead, and sing him to sleep. But now, I could do nothing. Nothing but watch his blood run down that awful cross. And Jesus said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost.
even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and he brought fine linen and took him down. It's over. Look at his cold, lifeless body. No man has ever suffered so. I can still hear his cries of agony when they drove the nails through his hands. Those hands that never did anything but good. Healed the sick. Gave sight to the blind. Broke bread to feed the hungry. Those strong carpenter's hands that I knew would care for me the rest of my days are now bloody, torn, lifeless, those kind, loving, beautiful hands. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Jesus may be out of the way, but I'm certain his followers will be busy trying to create some new mischief. Perhaps they might even try to steal the body and spread the rumor that Jesus has come back from the dead. I must see to it that Pilate has a guard posted at the tomb. I remained in hiding, too scared to go out into the street. Who knew what Caiaphas was planning next? 
What would I do now? Who really was this Jesus anyway? Did it really even matter? Nothing made sense. I just wanted to get back home to Galilee. It had been two days since Jesus' death. <clears throat> I was drifting in a sea of despair. Every waking moment I could see my son on that cross, crying out to pain, struggling to breathe. When I tried to close my eyes and sleep, the details became more vivid. The blood, the cursing, the darkness, the wickedness of those evil men who killed him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they found the stone rolled away. And they entered in, and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, and bowed their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living? among the dead he is not here but is risen and they returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven Mary Magdalene scared us all when she burst into the room shouting the tomb is empty the tomb is empty John and I took off running and we didn't stop till we got there and yes the tomb was empty and the linen cloth that had been wrapped around his body was laying perfectly in place, just as if his body had just vanished. And then dimly, the words of Jesus began to come back to me and whisper a faint glimmer of hope. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. The soldiers who were guarding the tomb came running to me, scared for their lives and very confused. They thought they had seen an angel roll the stone away from the tomb. And when the guards looked into the tomb, they thought the body was gone. But it was so dark, and they were so tired. They needed my help to remember the details. So I gave them some money, a rather large amount of money, and told them exactly what they saw. While they were asleep, the disciples came in the darkness, rolled the stone away, and stole the body of Jesus. It was really quite simple. An empty tomb? Oh, could it be? Mary Magdalene says she saw angels, two men in shining white with dazzling faces. Maybe she just imagined them. No, it's possible, I know. I remember the angel God sent to me over 30 years ago. I can still hear his voice. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And he shall reign forever. Oh, praise Jehovah, he is alive. Jesus' blood made the price, Satan's power has been begun. I 
Rumors were spreading like wildfire, and nobody knew what to believe. Later that evening, I got the disciples together to try to find out who had seen what and what we would do next. Most of us were still afraid of our own shadows, so we made sure the doors were all locked and the windows were covered. We didn't know if Caiaphas was going to come after one of us or all of us. Then came Jesus and stood in the midst. And said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. I felt the scars in his hands and the wound in his side. My utter despair was transformed into joy. Our king was alive, and I would follow him no matter where he led me. As it turned out, as it turned out the rumors were much harder to kill than Jesus had been. His followers kept making up stories about miraculous sightings of their dead Messiah. And that small band of men Jesus called his disciples, I can't explain it. But they were changed men. They weren't just a bunch of timid children anymore. My threats didn't begin to silence them. They were bold and confident. Even the threat of death only seemed to spur them on. What changed them? Most of the disciples would eventually be martyred for preaching the gospel and telling everyone they met about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why would these men so readily give their lives? Because we experienced the truth, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I saw him. I knew he was God, my God, and no power on earth would silence me again. To my shame, three times I denied my Lord. Oh, but I would not deny him again. And Jesus spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. 
And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He lives, and I live again because of him. I saw him carried up into the clouds, lifted up into the very heavens. My Lord lives, teacher, master, savior, king. He has forgiven my doubt, my denial, my sin, and I thank God he has not left me. As he promised, he is with me always. He sits at the right hand of God, my son, my Lord, my King. Even unto the end of the world, I will sing forth the praises of him that brought me out of the darkness into his marvelous light. The angel said that he will come again. Even so, my Lord Jesus comes. We lift up your name and give you glory, both, both now, now and, and forevermore. forevermore.
hand if you would. Thank you. Uh, appreciate you taking time and uh, come in this evening. I, uh, if you have a Bible, I'd like to share something with you from John chapter 3. If you have a Bible handy there with you. It's interesting. This is Jesus speaking in John chapter 3 to a very religious man named Nicodemus. Some of you might be familiar with that story. Jesus tells Nicodemus, if you go down to about number verse number 14, um, Brother Bill or somebody, you can turn the lights on in here. That would be fine. People might want to see if they have a Bible with them, it's a little easier if they could see it. That's good. Thank you. Notice verse number 14. The Bible says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then the verse that is so familiar to many, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A lot of people don't never really know the context of which that verse was spoken, but it was spoken to Nicodemus, and it was spoken about being born again. But it's interesting, isn't it, when Jesus speaks here about his death on the cross and uh, eventually his resurrection, he likens it to an Old Testament story. And when you think about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, we normally don't think about the Old Testament. But the story he refers to here in the Old Testament is one from the book of Numbers, chapter 21. The Israelites have uh, traveling from Egypt and traveling to the Promised Land, and uh, they got a little weary with the journey. All right, God has miraculously taken care of them. One of the things that God did uh, along the trip is He's provided food for them. Uh, they called it manna. Uh, it, it, it was a lack of not knowing what to call it. All right? Manna means what is it? All right? Uh, and they, you have to understand, they didn't have to work for it. They didn't have to go out and hunt it down. They didn't have to go seek it out. They just walked out every morning and there it was. And they'd have to gather up what they needed for that day. And if they didn't have it gathered, by the time the sun came up, the sun would burn it off and they wouldn't eat that day. And they couldn't gather more up and take a day off because whatever they gathered more than what they needed, it would breed worms and it would stink and it wouldn't be any good. Now, that was great for a while. But think about this. What's for breakfast? Manna. What's for lunch? Manna. What's for dinner? Manna. Tomorrow, what's for breakfast? Manna. That might have been scrambled manna. I don't know. But it was manna. What about lunch? Manna. Dinner? Manna. Hey, Easter Sunday, what's for lunch? Manna. Thanksgiving dinner, what are we having? Manna. Manna. They begin to complain. God heard their complaints. What God did was He judged them for their complaining and their discontent. And He sent snakes among them. Not just garter snakes, some innocent snake, poisonous snakes. And the snakes were biting the people and people were dying. It was a very, very tragic story. So they came to Moses and they said, Moses, pray to God that He takes the snakes away. Moses prayed to God, but God did not take the snakes away from the people. What he did was he told Moses to go get a, make a snake of brass or bronze. He said, and you put that brazen snake up on a pole and lift it up. And whoever will look to that lifted up serpent on that pole, they'll be healed from the snake bite. And then it's interesting to note that instead of removing the snakes, God made a provision for those who'd been bitten by the snakes. Look 
at the brazen snake. And everyone who took God at His word and looked at the snake was healed. The ones who believed God and did what He said and acted on that belief were taken care of. Now, it's pretty clear the application that Jesus was making, and I'm sure He knew Nicodemus should know this Old Testament story. So it would, not be, a, it would be a very familiar thing to Him. And Jesus, if you go forward now about 1,500 years from that time there in Numbers, Jesus says that if you, when I'm lifted up, just like that serpent was lifted up, if people will look to Me then they too can be healed from the sickness, from the snake bite that everybody's been bitten with, the snake bite of sin. And everybody can be healed from that. We cry out to God, why doesn't God just make all the sin go away? But God doesn't seem to do that, does He? You know what He did? He made provision for you and for me to get cure, a cure for the snake bite of sin. And that cure is what you're here celebrating this evening. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was on the cross dying for your sin and for my sins. He was making provision as He was lifted up from the earth on the cross. And just as people looked to the snake in that day, and they had to look to the brazen serpent in order to be cured from the snake bite, we have to look to Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sin and say, I'm trusting what Jesus has done for me to forgive my sin and to give me the gift of eternal life. But you can't just look at Christ dying on the cross. Because if that ended it, then he was just a martyr, like many others have been martyrs. That's why there's a resurrection. He's not just the Savior, my friend. He's the living Savior. No other religion of the world can lay claim to that. Only Christianity we have a living Savior. And so it validates His sacrifice for our sin. And so whoever looks to Christ in believing that Jesus did everything necessary for us to have eternal life and will put your faith and trust in Him, you're saved from the penalty of sin, which is death and hell. Just as the Israelites were saved from their sin of grumbling against God. The difference, of course, is this. They were only saved temporarily. They were only healed temporarily from that snake bite. But Christ's provision on the cross was a once and for all offering for sin. Once Jesus offered that sacrifice for sin, and we read this evening about Him ascending back to heaven, He sat down at the right hand of God because His work of redemption was complete. It's done. It's finished. Christ died once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. And God forgives sins no matter what they are or how many they are. Nobody's too bad to be saved. Nobody's too far gone. Thieves, murderers, adulterers, pornographers, you name it. They can be forgiven no matter what the sin. And truth is, you may be here tonight and say, well, I don't think I'm that bad of a sinner. But I want to remind you that everybody's sinned. We sometimes talked about this in our church services. You know, if you, if you got through the whole day today and just sinned one time, let's say you just sinned one time a day. By the way, that'd be a pretty good day. If you don't think you haven't done so well, let me talk to who you live with and we'll see how you made out. But one sin a day would be 365 sins in a year. Think about that. You, you start adding that up year after year after year after year. And after 30 years of living or 40 years of living or 50 years of living, you've got quite a few sins to account for. 
that's just one a day and most of us probably I'm just guessing I don't know I don't know about most of you but I know the choir sends more than that all right we have more than that that we have to deal with and so we understand whether it's just lying stealing gossiping ignoring people who need our help neglecting our family we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God but Christ died for our sins not just big sins little sins he died for sin and if you put your faith and trust in Christ you can have forgiveness of sin and a home in heaven when you die heaven's a wonderful place what a uh, what an amazing place it must be we were talking to a I was talking to a truck driver this morning and he was trying to tell us a little bit uh, something that Diane's probably seen before. Route 70 out in Colorado, he said when the sun is coming up and the Rocky Mountains are there, and he said it's just incredible. And, and, and he said he saw that and, and you experienced that, and he just said, you know what, atheist, you're wrong. There's a God. It was just beautiful. And, and, and yet he said, you know, if as beautiful as our nation is, as beautiful as the world is, he did all that in six days. Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. He's been preparing that place for a couple thousand years. I can't imagine what that's going to be like. I know sometimes we talk about our loved ones that are there and that's a wonderful comfort but the truth is I'm not sure we're going to know who else is there for the first few thousand years while we're just in awe of what we're looking at an amazing place called heaven a place where there's no war no pain the Bible says you'll wipe every tear from our eye we'll be in his presence so it's a wonderful thing. But when, when we receive Christ our Savior, listen, it's not just for the sweet by and by. It's also for a wonderful life now. It's also for a great life on this earth. I, I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm a Christian because I'm glad that one day when I take my last breath here, uh, my next breath will be in heaven. And that's a wonderful, absolute assurance and feeling that I have that, that, that has come from the Scripture that's a great comfort to me and I hope it will be a comfort to my loved ones. But I got a news for you. If that wasn't even there, I'd want to live as a Christian on earth. I'd want to live like a Christian, like the Bible says we should live. Because Jesus said, I've come, you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. Now, it doesn't mean all the problems go away. But it does mean I have a problem solver that I can take them to. I have someone that I can rely upon and someone that can solve those problems. And I know that no matter what, ex what trouble you experience, you've got someone you can go to that's greater than your trouble. And I've got someone I can turn to that's infinitely bigger than any problem that I face. So it's wonderful to see that I can have a life that is pleasing to God and that is blessed by God, free free to live the life that God intended me to live not bound by sin not bound by habits that hinder me from being what God wants me to be but I can have freedom in Jesus Christ the son shall make you free you'll be free indeed now you think about again going back to the, to the snake story of the Old Testament numbers think about that for a minute God told Moses now you're going to put this snake up on a pole and whoever looks there can be healed from their snake bite. But you have to understand something. Just because the snake was on the pole and it was lifted up didn't mean everybody got healed. They had to look at the snake. People had to act on their faith. They didn't just have to listen to Moses and say, yeah, that sounds good. I, I believe that's what God said. I believe that's what God told you to do. I believe that. We're not sure exactly how many Israelites were there in the wilderness. You hear any estimates from two to three million. But that's quite a crowd. 
And he didn't say he's stationing several of these snakes, you know, lift, lifted up several places throughout the area. It was just one. And they had to get to it. So they, they believed the area covered was about half the size of the state of Rhode Island. So whoever got bitten, they would have to get to where they could at least see the brazen serpent lifted up. And I'm sure there were a bunch of people who didn't quite believe Moses when he said there's provision for you to be healed. You don't have to die of the snake bite. It doesn't have to be fatal. There is a provision. You just have to look for the brazen, lift, brazen serpent lifted up. I wonder if some of them said, well, I think Moses has always been a little bit off. He's always been a little eccentric. In fact, I wonder who's going to look at some stupid snake on a pole. How that's gonna, how's that going to make me well? I mean, how's that going to get the, the, the poisonous venom out of my system? What's that going to do for me? Get real, Moses. Other people might have said, well, it sounds good, but that's not for me. I don't need any snake to get me better. I can get better. And guess what? You know what happened to those people? They died. They lost their life. Because the only way to be healed was to look and live. Look to the serpent and live. God offers a cure for our snake bite. And you can, you can be here this evening or you might have been around other people who have told you the story of Christ before and maybe you've been like some of those folks said, yeah, I think you, you guys who believe in that kind of stuff are a little bit off. I think you guys are, are in a dream world. Or other people say, yeah, you need a crutch like that, but I don't need a crutch like that. Well, here's the problem, my friend. We all die. And then what? The Bible is true. There's only one way to heaven. It's by looking to the one who was lifted up on the cross, Jesus Christ, and saying he was lifted up to die for my sins, and I will trust his work for me on the cross, his payment for my sin, as my hope for heaven. And if you trust in anything else, you will pay for your own sins in hell. That's the message of the resurrection. That's really the only, it's the only two groups of people the Bible says there are on the earth. Saved and lost. Saved and lost. There's no in between. There's no on the fence. You're on one side or the other. And you just have to look by faith and to Jesus and believe in Him. Believe means you put your faith in it. You put your confidence in it. You put your trust in it. And you will believe only in Christ. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You have to act upon your faith. Will you take advantage of the provision that God has made for you? That God sent His Son into the world to be the payment for our sin? Jesus said, nobody takes my life. Jesus said, I lay it down. And as you heard tonight, he said he'd take it up again. He did exactly what he said he'd do. And now he's alive, and the Bible says he's able to save all those that come unto God by him. Have you ever come to faith in Jesus Christ? Have you ever come to where you realize that he was lifted up for you? And that you put your faith in Him as your Savior? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He was lifted up. Lifted up to die. So we might live. So we might be forgiven of our sin. But you must, by faith, reach out to Him. And put your faith in Him as your Savior. I'm not asking you to put your faith in a church. I'm not asking you to put your faith in a preacher. 
I'm asking you what the Bible says to do, and that is put your faith in a Savior, which is Jesus Christ. This is the Easter time or the resurrection time. The other time, a lot of folks come to church, and we have a special cantata, it's Christmas time, and the angels said at Christmas time, at the birth of Jesus, they said, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. If God sent a Savior, somebody must have needed to be saved. And that's you and me. Have you trusted Him as your Savior? If not, I would extend that invitation for you to be able to do that this evening. Let's bow our heads for prayer, shall we? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just, just a brief moment before we dismiss. Just between you and God. I wonder... With our heads bowed and our eyes closed is before I pray and we end our service. I wonder how many folks in the room tonight would say, Pastor, I, I have personally put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. There was a time in my life when I realized that I was a sinner who needed a Savior and Jesus was the Savior I needed. And I have seen Him lifted up for me. And I have put my faith in Jesus as my Savior. And Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip that up for a moment that I may see it? And say, I know that I'm saved. I've, I've done that, Pastor. All right, you may put it down. Is there somebody here tonight and you say, I've never done that, Pastor. I don't know that I've ever called on Jesus. I've never personally put my faith in Him. I've never really, maybe you really never really understood what Calvary and the crucifixion was all about. But tonight... God's turned the light on. And you understand that you're a sinner who needs a Savior, and Jesus is a Savior you need. And if you tonight would simply call upon Him, and from your heart put your faith in Him, I'd like to help you word a prayer. Now, just saying a prayer with me won't, won't save you at all. You'll just be saying words. If you'd like to, from your heart, trust Jesus as your Savior, just where you are in your seat, would you just call out to Him and just say something like this, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sins in hell. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I now put my faith and trust in you as my Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Please help me live for you. If you're here this evening and you just prayed and you asked Jesus to be your Savior, would you let me pray for you? I'll not embarrass you. I'll not call you out. But would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, I prayed this evening and asked Jesus to save me. Would you slip your hand up and let's just let me pray for you? God bless you. God bless you. Is there somebody else? Say, Pastor, pray for me this evening. I ask Christ to be my Savior. Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and so loving us that you gave your only begotten Son. And Lord, thank you that he died for our sins, that he was lifted up. And all that will look to him can look and live. Thank you for the wonderful story that, of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to keep the focus where it needs to be. The world seems like they always try to take things away and fill, fill everyone's mind with the things that don't really matter. Lord, help us to focus on this night and on the morning with the resurrection of our Savior. Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for each one of these who have come to uh, be in the service this evening. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. We love you. Give us a good evening and prepare our hearts for the Lord's day tomorrow. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Listen, thank you for coming tonight, and uh, we'll let the choir come down here and uh, join you, and you can... Uh,
get to talk to those who you came to, to see this evening. Thanks for taking time out of your Saturday night and being here. God bless you. You're dismissed.